in Philippians chapter three, in verses four to eight, Paul is writing, the Apostle Paul, to a church that he's helped shepherd into existence. So he knows the people and they know him. He says, if anyone else thinks he has reasons to put confidence in the flesh, I have more. He's about to, what he's really saying is my resume is better than your resume. I'm more accomplished than you. And then he's about to list his accomplishments for us. It's pretty impressive. He says, I was circumcised on the eighth day of the people of Israel. That's pretty impressive that eight days into his earthly journey, he was honoring God. Now, there's really no action that he, in, he chose, but he was the beneficiary of being born into a family that intended from his eighth day for him to honor the Lord. So he's going to include that in his story. I was of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of the Hebrews. In regard to the law, a Pharisee. As for zeal, I persecuted the church. As for legalistic righteousness, I was faultless. But whatever was to my profit, I now consider loss for the sake of Christ. That's the pivot point in this passage. Whatever may have been to my credit, whatever I would have considered an accolade, an achievement, a point of accomplishment, he said, I just consider it lost. It's irrelevant for the sake of Christ. What is more, I consider everything a loss compared to the surpassing greatness of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord, for whose sake I have lost all things. I consider them rubbish that I may gain Christ. I was a rising star in the Pharisees, he said. I had a zeal that was, was more pronounced than any of my peer group. I was on the fast track to success and achievement and accomplishment and position and power and authority, but then I met Jesus. And he said, I decided that all of those things was like rubbish. It was trash. It was to be disposed of compared to the surpassing greatness of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord. May I ask you a question? What aspect of your life and your journey through time are you most grateful for? What part do you celebrate with the most enthusiasm? When someone asks about you and your story, how do you introduce yourself? What are the leading characteristics? How do you identify? We had a little fun earlier with the, the part of the states we come from. But the rea in reality, the most significant part of my choices in time have to do with the person of Jesus of Nazareth. And we should all understand that to become a Christ follower means that there's a leaving behind. There's a separation that has to take place. We don't want to take our pre-faith behaviors with us into the service of our Lord. We don't want to take the same aspirations that we had for our lives, the same passions for our hobbies and our distractions because we've met a new king. We're under a new authority. We have a new reason for drawing our breath each time we inhale. The invitation of Jesus to follow him, to be his disciple, is a call to separation. I understand that's not a message we hear a great deal, but it doesn't make it less true. The call to follow the Lord is not a call to blend in to a secular culture. It's a call to be distinctive. I can illustrate it, I think, a little more clearly. In Ephesians chapter 2, in verse 1, Paul, again, is writing to a group of people that he knows well. He was there when the church of Ephesus was taking its first steps. He spent months and months with them, teaching them and encouraging them. So he knows them and they know him well. And he says, as for you, you were dead in your transgressions and sins in which you used to live when you followed the ways of this world and the ruler of the kingdom of the air, the spirit who is now at work in those who are disobedient. It's a timing passage. He's reminding them that at one time they followed the ways of this world. But he's saying to them, you don't live that way any longer. You're on a new path. You have a new set of ambitions. You have a new set of uh, objectives. You, your, your discretionary time is spent in new ways. I've come to ask you a question, and I know to a degree I'm preaching to the choir because on a beautiful fall Saturday night, you're sitting outside at a church service. I get that, but I want to ask a question beyond the obvious in your heart, in your ambitions, in your aspirations. I want you to reflect upon how knowing Jesus has changed that set of things. What have you left behind? What have you had to separate yourself from? Is that leaving complete? 
Has the separation been as full as you feel the Lord would invite you to? Or do you still stand with a foot in some of those places? Is your heart still divided? In James chapter one, it says a double-minded man should understand he won't receive anything from the Lord because they're unstable in all their ways. They're just like a wave from the sea that's tossed. We shouldn't imagine we will receive from the Lord. I want you to hear what Paul is saying. He said something similar to the church in Colossae, in Colossians chapter three and verse five. He said, put to death, therefore, whatever belongs to your earthly nature. And then he gives some examples. It's not an inclusive list, but if you want to know what that earthly, Adamic, carnal nature gives expression to, what would it look like? He gives you a little sampling. Sexual immorality, impurity, lust, the desire for evil, greed. He said, because of these, the wrath of God is coming. He said, you used to walk in these ways in the life you once lived, but now you must rid yourselves of all such things as these. And then he gives us some more examples. Anger, rage, malice, slander, filthy language. Don't lie to each other. Since you've taken off your old self with its practices and have put on the new self, which is being renewed in knowledge in the image of its creator. It's very clear in the language that Paul is anticipating a separation from a previous way of life. Not just a new destination for a few minutes on the weekend. Not just saying I'm an adherent to a new religious expression or I found faith. He's suggesting to us a rather dramatic orientation in our lives. In fact, he puts the responsibility upon us in verse eight. He said, now you must rid yourselves. It isn't something God's going to do for us. One of the shocks of my life as I have walked with the Lord is God does not remove from me the arena of temptation. I have to decide what I'm gonna give myself to. And I would like to tell you that I made that decision, you know, when I was 20 something and it's never again presented itself. I'd like to tell you that, but it wouldn't be true. The reality is I have to guard my heart today. I have to be careful what I give my thoughts to what ambitions I will let creep into me. It's very easy to begin to think I, I'm entitled to something or I deserve something or I should recalibrate my goals and objectives because I, I wanna get ahead, I, I wanna keep up and I have to come back to that point that I am a servant of the most high God. I serve at his pleasure, that he sets my agenda. That it isn't my life any longer, that in that covenant am I made with him to receive eternal life, I yielded my journey under time to his authority. He is my king. I serve at his pleasure in the language of Paul to Timothy. I'm a good soldier enlisted under the authority of that king. He determines the place and time of my deployment. That's a pretty dramatic reorientation of our lives. You so most of our religious experience, we've been invited to know Jesus as our savior. We don't wanna to go to hell. And that's really wise. I would encourage you to try to avoid that at all cost. It's an eternal commitment and it's not one that will be beneficial or pleasing. But the invitation of scripture is not just to be saved, to know Jesus as savior. The invitation of scripture is to know Jesus as Lord. You see, Lord is about authority over your life. It's about who establishes the priorities. When Jesus is my Lord, it's not my time any longer. It's not just my money. It's not just my goal or my ambition or what I want to do or what I feel like. I serve under his authority. And the assignment is to know what the Lord would like me to do. And to the degree that I can understand that, to be busy about that. And it's the same for you. That's not just the assignment of preachers. Now, in my life, I have found that takes consistent attention because I can get off the rails pretty quickly. I have found I can give myself license for just about any form of self-indulgence I can imagine if I don't continually, purposefully listen to the voice of God in my heart. It's why I need the people of God. It's why I need daily exposure to the Word of God. I need the reminder that God means what He said. We just finished the book of Nehemiah, if you're doing the reading with us. And I was 
It, it impacted me this time as I read those last chapters of Nehemiah when he returned to Jerusalem and he and Ezra found that the people had intermarried that they were marrying with people of other faiths and other covenants with God. And there was almost a sense of panic that came to them because they've been living as slaves in a foreign land because of just that kind of disobedience. And they got the people together and they said, you can't do this. If you do this, our children will grow up as slaves and our grandchildren will grow up as slaves. You can't do this. Well, it's similar language to what Paul is saying to the church in Colossae or the church in Ephesus. And I think we live a long way away from that. We're much more familiar with sloppy agape, with presumptive grace. Oh, you can do whatever. And then when you have kind of a half a minute, just look at the Lord and go, oh, <laughs> I'm sorry. It's almost as if we mock God. Folks, we've got to cultivate a respect for God, a reverence for God, an honor for God, where we understand we will not willingly, purposefully, intentionally make disobedient choices with our days under the sun, that we will rid ourselves of ungodliness, that we will purposefully separate ourselves from those who choose to do that. If you spend your discretionary time with people who lead ungodly lives, you will become increasingly ungodly. I don't think you would purposefully spend your time with someone you knew that was COVID positive because you don't want to even take the chance of the symptoms. Well, I promise you ungodliness is far more devastating than any virus from Wuhan. We've got to separate ourselves from the world. Thank you for watching this video. If you enjoyed it, subscribe to the channel. You know the drill, hit the bell for notifications. If you want to, leave a comment.